Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Isn't it great to have a microphone here, especially with the mask on? Uh, today we have a real treat. Uh, this, I think, is our third annual exposition of the Stanford Energy Student Lecture Honorees. As near as I can figure, uh, this is a deal where you work really hard in your lab for three or four years, you do exceptional cutting edge research, and then your advisor no nominates you uh, to be included in the competition for uh, the best student uh, technology uh, lectures. And uh, that goes on all summer. I see uh, Richard Sassoon and Maxine Lim who run it uh, here. And it's kind of like the Olympics. And I'm actually gonna let uh, Richard, Richard Sassoon, no pressure you guys. Uh, I'm gonna introduce my, my uh, dear friend and uh, colleague Richard Sassoon uh, who is currently Dr. Richard Sassoon, uh, who's currently the executive director of the Stanford Energy Alliance. And when I met him, uh, 2003, I see, uh, was the managing director of the Global Climate and Energy Project. Please don't ask him for any embarrassing stories about our travel to uh, cutting edge energy laboratories around the real world. He just told me that he's written this up or was interviewed about this recently, so I'm not interested in seeing that. So without further ado, Richard is a, a, a renowned scientist in his own right, a PhD in physical and analytic chemistry, and uh, probably the most knowledgeable person about all aspects of broad, a broad range of energy technologies I know. So Richard's going to introduce the uh, panel and uh, moderate their presentations, which I'm really looking forward to hearing. Richard. Well, thank you, John. Um, I won't embarrass you today, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so welcome to this session where we showcase some of our top student researchers. Uh, this year, we're delighted to have four speakers who have been honored as 2021 as Stanford Energy's Distinguished Student Lecturers. So as many of you may already know, we hold this annual uh, Stanford Energy Student Lecture Series every summer. And this year represents the 11th time that we've conducted this program. The goal of the program is really twofold. One is to help students better communicate key takeaway messages about their energy-related research to a broad technical audience. And then two is to showcase some of the cutting edge energy research that students are conducting right here on campus. So over the summer, we had um, 14 uh, Stanford students give talks, and then a judging panel selected the top four. And we'll hear from them today. Uh, before introducing them, let me just uh, first thank the organizers of this program. Uh, Yufei Yang was the seminar manager, and she was uh, helped by a, a number of student representatives. And uh, then um, we have Maxine Lim, who has been doing this for all 11 years, and she helped coordinate everything. And as usual, everything went very smoothly. And then the judging panel was um, Steve Eglash, Jenny Mill, Michael Michaela, who, who joined me. So let me now go ahead and introduce all four presenters They'll each give their talks one after another. And since we're on a sort of tight schedule, we'll hold off on the Q&A until after the last talk. And then you can address questions to all four of the speakers. So our first speaker will be Peter Janika, who is a sixth year PhD student in materials science, working with Professor Will Chu. His work focuses on understanding the atomic and electronic structure of positive electrode materials for the lithium ion batteries. Uh, next up, we'll have Emily Lacroix, who's a fifth year PhD candidate in Earth System Science. She's advised by Professor Scott Fendorf, and the results of her research should help inform land management decisions to increase soil carbon storage. Then we'll have uh, Julian Behill. He's a fourth year PhD candidate in chemical engineering, working with Professor Hema Karunadasa and with Mike Tony. His research focuses on halide perovskite semiconductors that could lead to more energy efficient lighting and solar energy conversion applications. And then last but not least is uh, Lily Buchner, who's a fifth year PhD candidate in mechanical engineering. She's advised by Professor Ram Jagapal. Her research interests include data driven control, optimization, and simulation in different power system applications. So without further ado, I'll ask uh, 
Peter to give the, the first talk. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for the introduction. I hope we can live up to these lofty expectations. Um, but anyway, uh, so my name is Peter, and um, today I'm going to talk to you about battery degradation through cycling-induced oxygen release. Um, so first, I wanted to introduce how a battery actually works. Um, so in general, a battery um, uh, consists of a mobile ion, in our case lithium, which will be shuttled back and forth between a low-energy reservoir and a high-energy reservoir. And in general, the amount of energy that we can extract from this battery um, is the product of two different things. Um, the first is the capacity, which refers to the number of lithium ions which can, uh, will move back and forth in a given cycle. And the second is the voltage, and this is related to the energy that we can extract per lithium ion that moves. Uh, now, in my talk today, I'm only going to focus on one component of this battery, which is the positive electrode. And if we take a look at what the structure of um, the positive electrode material that I've been working with um, looks like, um, you'll see that this is a uh, layered structure with layers of oxygen, um, lithium, and transition metals. Um, sorry. Um, and you'll notice that some of the transition metals are replaced with lithium atoms, and this is why it's known as a uh, lithium-rich positive electrode. Now, one property of this material that I'm going to focus on today is the transition metal oxidation state, or the average transition metal oxidation state. Um, so we can see here that for this material, it's about 3.4+. plus. Um, but once we charge the material, um, we have to remove lithium from the structure. And then the situation becomes um, a little bit different. The structure now will look something like this. Um, and there are multiple, many things that change once we remove such a dramatic amount of lithium from the structure. Um, but again, I want to focus for now on the transition metal oxidation state, which has now been pushed significantly higher to about 4.6+. plus. Um, in general, this can be a good thing. Higher oxidation states do tend to give higher voltages for, the, um, for batteries, so this would enable us to extract more energy. Um, but they also have a potential disadvantage as well. Um, so you might imagine that there's no guarantee that this structure is still going to be stable once we've removed such a large amount of lithium from it. Um, and and uh, in doing so, we've gotten such a high transition metal oxidation state. And uh, so the degradation I'll be talking about today has to do with oxygen release, which can lower that transition metal oxidation state down to a more reasonable value. Um, so if we take a look, or we, we know that this structure actually is not perfectly stable over time if we look at the um, electrochemical performance. So here, what we're seeing is that as we cycle this battery over 250 cycles, um, the voltage on both charge, and charge is going from bottom left to top right, and discharge going from top left to bottom right, the voltage during both charge and discharge is decreasing over cycling. Um, and what this means practically is that we have less energy that we're going to be able to extract from this battery as um, time goes on, as we continue to cycle. You'll also notice that the um, uh, x-intercept uh, is not changing that much. So the capacity, the number of lithium that are actually going in and out of the structure in a given cycle is actually almost constant. It only decreases by a couple percent or so over 250 cycles. And I'll come back to this point um, a little bit later. So the question that was really motivating us to start this research is to um, try to answer the question of what's causing the voltage to drop over time so that we can um, design strategies to prevent that voltage decay and enable the batteries to maintain um, a larger proportion of energy for, you know, if you're using an electric vehicle, you might want to use the same battery for five, eight, 10 years. Um, so we really need to keep a stable voltage for much longer than just 250 cycles. So um, as I've mentioned, I'm going to focus a lot today on the transition metal oxidation state. Um, so how can we actually measure this? Um, one way we can do this is with a technique known as X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Um, and in this technique, we, will, um, we can uh, come in with an X-ray of varying energy on our material. And if the energy of this X-ray is exactly equal to the energy difference between um, an occupied and unoccupied state, then the material can absorb that X-ray and promote an electron to a higher energy state. We can then change the energy of the incoming X-ray and record how many are absorbed as a function of energy. And in doing so, we can get an X-ray absorption spectrum. Now, as it turns out, um, the X-ray absorption spectrum is highly sensitive to the transition metal oxidation state. And we can see that here for several um, manganese-based reference compounds with different um, manganese oxidation states. Um, so in general, we can see uh, from the graph on the right that um, as the oxidation state increases or goes higher, 
then we have a higher absorption energy um, in the X-ray absorption spectra. And this is basically due to the fact that uh, the core electrons are held on to more tightly if you have a higher oxidation state. So what happens if we look at our own material? Um, so if we look at uh, our own material as a function of cycle number, we can sort of see the opposite happening. Um, so we have the pristine material in, in black there, and then as we continue to cycle it, it's actually shifting to lower energy, indicating that the oxidation state of the transition metal is dropping. So here, this is for manganese, meaning we're exciting from a manganese 1s orbital. Um, but the same thing happens if we uh, look at the cobalt spectra. Um, so there are three transition metals in this compound, manganese, cobalt, and nickel. And nickel uh, is about the same. This is just due to the particular electronic structure of this material, which I won't get into today. Um, but in general, we can see that the average transition metal oxidation state is dropping. Often in these materials, oxidation state changes are associated with changes in the lithium content. Um, but we have measured the lithium content of these materials directly over cycling. And you'll notice that um, first, there's not much of a change in the lithium content. But secondly, it's actually going in the wrong direction to explain the um, spectroscopic changes that we see. Usually a decrease in lithium would be associated with an oxidation or increase of the transition metal oxidation state. But here we're seeing a small um, drop in lithium content and a, also a drop in the um, oxidation state. So we believe that this is not um, due to change in lithium content, but is actually due to oxygen, which has been released from the material very, very slowly over hundreds, uh, over hundreds and hundreds of cycles. And this gives us a good explanation for why the voltage is dropping as well, um, because lower oxidation states of the transition metals are associated with lower voltages for the battery. So to dig a little bit um, more deeply into this phenomenon um, uh, in order to really develop strategies to prevent it from happening, um, uh, the next thing I'll talk about is using the same principle of X-ray absorption spectroscopy, but now adding um, microscopy into the picture. Um, so here are some results from a technique known as X-ray tychography, which I won't be talking about today. Um, or, and what you can see is that now we've spatially resolved the transition metal oxidation state within individual particles from this material. So in the pristine material on the left, um, we have nearly a four plus oxidation state everywhere except for maybe right at the very surface. But after um, even just uh, even 125 cycles, we have a significant amount of transition metal um, reduction even inside the bulk of these particles, even 100 nanometers or so from the surface. Um, and we can see that even more clearly if we um, uh, kind of uh, condense all of this data into the plot on the left. So this means that this oxygen release is really, um, or oxygen originating in the bulk of the particles do, uh, does eventually um, get released over hundreds and hundreds of um, electrochemical cycles. Um, so with this spectroscopy results in mind, and given that we found the material to be still a single phase, there are basically two potential um, atomic structures that could explain this. Um, the first is this oxygen vacancy structure. This is the same as the pristine material, but now we've just simply removed some of the oxygen atoms and replaced them with vacancies. Um, another possibility is this densified structure, and this um, forms by um, losing oxygen and lithium kind of simultaneously and getting a structure with um, a higher transition metal content. Both of these can explain the drop in transition metal oxidation state, um, but um, the biggest difference is really the lithium content because you do have to lose such a large amount of lithium to form this densified structure. And as you may remember, so we did measure the lithium content directly and also electrochemically we saw um, that the capacity or the number of lithium moving in and out was nearly the same over cycling. Um, and so we're able to conclude from this that the oxygen vacancy structure is dominant. Um, and so basically what's happening over many cycles is that oxygen is diffusing very slowly from the bulk with a kind of vacancy diffusion mechanism um, and eventually gets released at the surface. So just to briefly mention some possible um, mitigation strategies for this. Uh, so if we think about our oxide particle, there are a few different um, areas that we can look at to try to prevent this. Um, kind of the most common thing that people have looked at is um, coating the material with something that would block oxygen but still allow lithium through. Um, this turns out to be pretty difficult. We have obtained some coated materials from collaborators that um, seem to show the same amount of oxygen loss eventually. So it's a challenging problem, but I do think it's potentially possible um, to do this. Um, since oxygen release is generally triggered by these very high transition metal oxidation states, you can imagine 
um, having a lower oxidation state right at the surface where the process kind of starts as a potential way to prevent this. And then finally, there are, uh, you can imagine if we can lower the oxygen diffusivity within the bulk, then that's another possibility as well. And um, one way to potentially do this is by stopping cation disordering. This has been suggested um, in sodium layered materials, and you can ask more about this in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, so to sort of wrap up here, the main conclusions are that um, oxygen leaves the bulk material during cycling, and this results in the presence of oxygen vacancies. And therefore, preventing this bulk diffusion and release of oxygen is going to be very important for um, stabilizing the voltage over hundreds of cycles. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, my research group, which is Will Chu's group in material science. Um, and this is also a collaborative effort with people at both um, SLAC and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, um, as well as Samsung. So thank you. So hi, I'm Emily LaCroix. Thanks again for being here. And I'm really excited to talk to you about my work um, studying soils and, as a form of soil carbon storage. So soils are actually the largest fast cycling carbon pool. They store over 2,300 gigatons of carbon, which is more carbon than all of the plants on Earth in the atmosphere combined. And the size of the soil carbon pool is regulated by inputs and outputs. So the main input to soil carbon is actually plants. So plants bring in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis to build their plant parts, and those plant parts eventually end up in the soil. And then balancing those inputs, we have microbial respiration. So there's microorganisms living in the soil that use the soil carbon to drive energy during respiration, and that releases carbon dioxide. So in thinking about these balance of inputs and outputs, you could imagine if the inputs to soil carbon were greater than the outputs, soils can act as a carbon sink. And this seems like a really amazing strategy for mitigating climate change, except there's one big caveat, which is that the controls on carbon dioxide emissions from soils are really poorly understood. Um, you know, getting more carbon into soils is pretty straightforward, grow more plants, but how do we know that that newly input carbon isn't just gonna be turned straight back into CO2? So this has been the subject of a lot of soil science research for multiple decades. And through that research, we know that one of the primary controls on this soil carbon outputs are the role of minerals. So in soils, you have mineral surfaces and carbon can be, become adsorbed to the mineral surfaces and it's essentially unavailable for microbial respiration. Um, you might be thinking, we could just change the minerals of all the soil on Earth. It's not really practical. So first, um, minerals have a finite surface area. So there's only so much carbon that can stick to minerals. And secondly, it's just really impractical to change the mineral composition of a soil. And so this leaves us with this really big question, which is how do we manage agricultural soils to be carbon sinks? And you might notice I skipped straight to agricultural. It's because um, in the contiguous United States, over 50% of the land is um, classified as crop or rangeland, meaning that there's already the infrastructure in place to monitor and manage these soils. So it's a good place to start for natural climate solutions. And this brings me to the topic of our group's work, which is uh, anoxic microsites and their potential as a mechanism for soil carbon storage. An anoxic microsite is just a non-majority soil volume in which oxygen supply is slower than microbial demand for oxygen. So in other words, in an otherwise well aerated soil, you'll have these pockets where there's strong oxygen demand from microbes and oxygen diffusion can't keep up with that demand. So you're left with a pocket that's without oxygen and those pockets are called microsites. And so within anoxic microsites, Microbial respiration of soil carbon is slowed by approximately 90% on a per volume basis. They can serve as trace sources of nitrous oxide and methane to the atmosphere, so it's not totally clear cut. And perhaps most pertinently, they're still really poorly understood and thus represent a really big opportunity, but also a vulnerability for soil carbon storage. And so the goal of our group's work is to determine the contribution of anoxic microsites to soil carbon storage across different soil properties and management practices. And today I'm just going to talk to you about a study that looks at the influence of texture and also climate, or in this case moisture, um, on anoxic microsites. <laughs> 
And before I dive in, I needed to put in a quick soil physics uh, lecture, which is that soil oxygen supply is slower in fine textured and wet soils. So in the left panel, you can see for texture, if you imagine that an oxygen molecule needs to diffuse a net distance, um, in a finer textured soil, the diffusion path length is a lot longer. So oxygen supply tends to be hampered or inhibited in fine textured soils. Um, in terms of moisture, oxygen diffuses 10,000 times more slowly through water than it does through gas or air-filled pore space. So whenever oxygen encounters a water-filled pore or is trying to diffuse into a waterlogged soil, there's going to be really poor oxygen supply. And so because of these paradigms, we hypothesized that the contribution of anoxic microsites to soil carbon storage would be greatest and finer in wetter soils. To test this hypothesis, we actually collected soils from the Stanford dish. So we collected soils from three different textures along a hill slope, and we applied um, two different moisture treatments to the cores. To measure the contribution of anoxic microsites to soil carbon storage, we relied really heavily on this framework, which is this idea that if a soil has anoxic microsites that are contributing to soil carbon storage, if you were all of a sudden to aerate that soil, there should be some sort of increase in the steady state CO2 efflux after that aeration event. And that increase in CO2 efflux should be commensurate or representative of the carbon stabilized by anoxic microsites. And so we applied two different aeration treatments in the lab. The first was we incubated soils under a regular atmosphere, so like the air we breathe, which is 21% oxygen. And then another subset we incubated under a 32% oxygen atmosphere. And what we found was that the extra oxygen actually increased CO2 emissions from sandy loam soils, which are the coarsest soils that we sampled. And to orient you a bit on this plot, because we'll see a similar one to it, each panel represents a different texture of soil. So finest is on the left and coarsest is on the right. And the X positions are moisture. And then the black bar is going to represent kind of the control CO2 efflux from the soil. And the red bar will represent the CO2 efflux um, from the more oxygenated treatment. And so you can see there's not really a big difference between the black and red bars, except for in the sandy loam soil. And the effect seems to be a little bit more pronounced in the wetter treatment. The second aeration technique that we applied was physical disturbance. So we took a soil and we disaggregated it. So we broke it out of its core put it through a sieve and spread it in a broad area pan to aerate it as best we could. And this is also meant to sort of simulate tillage, which is a very regular practice in croplands. And what we found was that physical disturbance increased CO2 emissions from both the loam and the sandy loam soils, but there was no effect in the finest textured soil. Uh, the effect seems to be a little bit greater in the wetter soils, but we need more replicates um, to be sure about the influence of moisture. So to revisit our hypothesis, which was, you know, anoxic microsites would matter most in the finest soils, we weren't right. <laughs> so our hypothesis was wrong. Um, and this has sort of led us to a new evolving hypothesis, which is the role of microbial oxygen demand. So if you think back to three minutes ago when I taught you about mineral protection, um, if you imagine a fine textured soil versus a coarse textured soil, a fine soil has a lot more surface area of minerals uh, for carbon to stick to. And then a coarse soil, on the other hand, has a lot less mineral surface area. So as a result, in the coarser soils, a greater proportion of the carbon is free and available for microbial respiration. And so as microbes are trying to respire that carbon aerobically, it creates a big demand for oxygen. And so our thought is maybe the oxygen demand is actually driving the formation of the anoxic microsites. And so diffusion just can't keep up with that microbial demand. And so some conclusions from this work, anoxic microsites may be most useful for leveraging carbon storage in soils with low mineral protection capacity, so coarse soils. A disturbance should be avoided in sandy soils to maximize soil car carbon storage.
And our next steps are to apply this methodology across the U.S. corn and cotton belts. So I spent this past summer sampling at a few long-term tillage experiments across the U.S., and I can talk about that more in the Q&A. And with that, I want to thank all my funding sources and my wonderful lab group um, and the Energy Seminar for hosting us today. I thank you. My name is Julian, and I am in the Chemical Engineering and Chemistry Departments, and I'm going to talk today about our work on understanding and trying to manipulate some of the defects that we see in halide perovskite semiconductors. And this is where I'm very glad I'm following Peter, because he gave a great introduction of electronic structure and defects. Uh, the materials that we're interested in in particular are semiconductors, and these really fall somewhere between metals and insulators in terms of electronic structure. Um, so we can think about the occupied states and unoccupied states of material relative to energy. So a semiconductor will have something that has somewhat of an intermediate band gap between these two and will have some interesting optical and usually electronic properties as well. So we can imagine now in the energy landscape where these type of materials come in are in a few different places. The one that we probably all know very well is in photovoltaic devices. So in this case, we want to absorb a lot of photons from the sun and then we'll try and separate the electron in the hole to get some electrical power from our device. So here we want to have a low band gap, absorb a lot of light, and then separate our carriers. You can also imagine basically the exact opposite situation where we provide energy to overcome the band gap energy. And then what we really want to do is collect this light that comes out or tune the properties to tune the emission from the material. So here we'll have a high band gap energy and then focus on the emission properties of our material. But to go back to solar absorbers, that's really kind of what we'll focus on today in terms of the materials and the applications. Uh, this is the architecture of a very efficient, efficient silicon solar cell. And if we zoom in in particular on the uh, absorber layer, so this is the silicon, uh, you might imagine this perfect silicon lattice where we have the same atomic structure extending in all three dimensions. Um, however, we can have defects that occur in these materials. So if we now substitute one of the silicon atoms for titanium, um, we can really, really uh, greatly affect the efficiency of the solar cell. So this can reduce the efficiency by more than 50%, even at super low concentrations. Uh, so considering the defects in these uh, materials that are usually thought to be perfect is very important for real world applications. And so now where we come in, uh, we study these halide perovskite semiconductors, which is this crystal structure here where you have these metal halide octahedra extending in three dimensions. And really, they've, they're very old materials. So you can see they've been studied since the 1890s, but not really implemented into uh, solar cells and optoelectronic devices until about 2010. Um, so you can see now there's a lot of excitement about these materials because they've really just um, gained a lot of efficiency in the last 10 years, essentially. So now we're trying to understand a little bit better uh, what makes these materials work? What makes them degrade a lot of different aspects? So one, one benefit is that they're very easy to synthesize, so we can make them near room temperature, and uh, we can also manufacture them into thin films for devices very easily. Uh, but one of the downsides to the fact that they're easy to make, they're also very easy to degrade. So we can imagine now if I take a slice out of the crystal structure and we look at an atom here that's missing, this is a vacancy just like we discussed before in the battery materials, um, now you can get free movement of the halide through the material, and so this can actually be a bad thing. So you can imagine degradation processes uh, and other polarization things that occur in devices based on the fact that you have all these ions moving around. Uh, and this is now where we come in. We're inorganic chemists, so we tend to study the bulk properties of these crystals. And my two colleagues, Adam and Nate, uh, we're among the first to discover some of these defect reactions and then characterize a lot about the thermodynamics and the transport of these vacancies through materials. Uh, so now this is a double perovskite crystal. So we have two metals rather than one, but it's the same structure. And actually, if you just leave a crystal like this out to sit, it will lose bromine over time. So it's a bromide crystal. You're losing the bromide gas. And that actually contributes to the electronic structure. So we see two electrons go in. Uh, and then we can see the conductivity increasing significantly over time. And then what's cool is that you can now expose it to bromine and it will go back to the initial state. So we know now that this is an equilibrium where we have the perfect bromide lattice, which is an equilibrium with a vacancy, the halogen gas, and two electrons. So we can manipulate this equilibrium, essentially. 
And now where I came in, we've been studying this other material which has a very similar structure, cesium-10,4 iodide. We can grow these large, beautiful crystals, as you can see in the image there. Uh, and we've been studying a lot their conductivity and uh, some scattering methods to characterize the structure as well. And you essentially see the same type of behavior where the conductivity is increasing over time, which is indicative of this halogen exchange reaction. Uh, and one thing you'll notice is that the shape of this curve is really nice compared to the last crystal. And it actually gives us an indication that uh, there's a diffusion limited process going on. And so we've, we've gone into the detail now of this, uh, this material and the transport properties. So we can repeat this measurement at three different temperatures or even more different temperatures. Uh, and we can apply a diffusion model to it as well. So we're modeling the, the movement of the vacancy from the surface of the crystal into the bulk of the crystal. And what we get out of that are some kinetic parameters. So we can now understand what the diffusion coefficient is, how fast the vacancy is moving through the crystal, and also the activation energy. So actually how much energy it takes to migrate the vacancy through the crystal. So now my, my PhD is actually focused a lot on seeing these defects and really um, understanding the structure as well as the electronic structure. Um, and so we can have a real space model of what this material looks like with these metal halide octahedra, like I mentioned. And then if you imagine doing an X-ray scattering measurement, so you take a crystal and you hit it with X-rays, what do you expect to see in the X-ray scattering pattern, the diffraction profile? So you can see with a perfect material, uh, you see a perfectly spherical symmetric Bragg peak. However, if you start to generate a lot of defects in the material, now you have strain fields in the material. And this will give rise to some asymmetry in your diffraction peak. So now we can see the shape is changing and I'll arbitrarily just add some more defects here. And we can see that in the extreme case where we have a lot of defects, now we have a very different profile in our X-ray scattering profile. So now I can go look at this in the lab and see if we can characterize this type of behavior. So we've done that a little bit. We've started to get some initial measurements. One of those that we can do in real space is to actually image this using electron microscopy. So now we're looking in real space at the structure and if we can push down to the atomic resolution, we should be able to see some of these vacancies and defects forming. And then also doing the X-ray scattering measurement. So this is what I was talking about in terms of the simulated patterns. Um, we can start to see initial results that show this asymmetry in the, in the X-ray scattering profile, which gives us some indication that there are defects in the structure. So now we've characterized in the halide double perovskites pretty extensively that there's this defect reaction occurring. But of course, we also want to uh, motivate some changes that we can make to the crystal structure that could potentially disfavor this reaction or stabilize the material in a device. One of those ways is uh, by doping. So actually, uh, on purpose, implementing some dopants or defects into the material that will actually offset the effect that we see. So really what we want to see is this electron concentration, just a flat line with respect to the x-axis here. Uh, however, we see this, this very slopey line that's basically following the vacancy concentration, so this is not good. Uh, however, if we incorporate some 2 plus dopant into the material at a higher concentration, now we can somewhat fix or stabilize the material. So now we see a flatter line with respect to that electron concentration. And then going even further beyond the double perovskites, we really want to show in some of these lead halides uh, that actually show up in high efficiency devices that the same, kind of occurring, the, the same kind of process could be occurring. So establish how general this halogen exchange reaction is across the whole family of materials. So with that, I'll just wrap up by, by summarizing to say that we really characterized this halogen exchange mechanism pretty extensively. And we think that we need to have some sort of atomic level or chemical solution at the local level that will disfavor this reaction uh, in order to really stabilize the device and then the module. Because you can think about encapsulants and some other techniques, but really we're talking about very small molecules at the atomic scale. So we think with the, a chemical solution or atomic level solution, we can really stabilize these materials. And with that, I'll just wrap up by thanking my advisors, uh, Hema and Mike the three folks who were most involved in this work with me, all the group members, uh, funding sources, and some of the collaborators on the structural measurements. Thank you. All right, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Buchler, and I'm going to be talking about my work on learning accelerated power flow simulations.
So I want to first motivate this work by talking about how the power grid works and how it's changing. So traditionally, power systems have been centralized with power generated by large-scale power plants. And that power is distributed to consumers through transmission and distribution systems. But as the costs of renewables and energy storage fall, we're seeing more and more of those resources installed both at the utility scale and as distributed energy resources in both residential and commercial applications. And so as these changes occur, we're, utilities are going to need more and more need better tools to analyze how these changes affect their system, right? So one of the main analytical tools that we use is called power flow simulation. Power flow simulation essentially allows us to analyze how power generation and demand affects voltages in a network. So voltages are important because most appliances and equipment are rated to operate at a specific voltage level. So for example, in your home, most of your appliances are rated to operate at either 120 or 240 volts. And so utilities use control systems in order to make sure those voltages are close to those nominal levels. And so power flow simulation essentially allows us to model this relationship between power and voltage. Normally we think about power in terms of its real and reactive components, so P and Q, and we talk about voltage in terms of its magnitude and, fa and phase angle uh, V and theta. So mathematically, power flow simulation involves solving the so-called power flow equations. The power flow equations are a nonlinear system of equations where power is defined explicitly in terms of voltage. But normally for simulation, we actually want the opposite mapping. We have the power injections at most of the nodes in a system, and we want to calculate voltage. But because of how these equations are structured, we can't analytically invert them, and so we have to use iterative numerical methods in order to solve them. And so these numerical methods, like Newton-Raphson or fixed point iteration, have been applied to this problem for many, many decades and have been highly studied and optimized. And for a single calculation, they are very efficient. But normally, for analysis, we want to do these types of calculations as part of a time series simulation that involves lots and lots of power flow calculations. So at each time step, for example, we have some inputs to our power flow problem. We use a power flow solver, which is a numerical method, in order to solve that system of equations, and we get a solution. And we repeat this for every time step. And so this type of setup is often called quasi-static power flow simulation, and is one particular flavor of power flow simulation and is often used for steady state type analysis. So that's things that happen at this time scale of say minutes to hours. And so there's a variety of different available simulators out there that do this type of analysis. And you can imagine if you, for example, have a really long time horizon or you want to model uncertainty in some variable in your system and need to run a lot of simulations, you have to do a lot of power flow calculations and that can be computationally expensive. So there's a variety of ways to speed up these calculations. For example, people often try to decouple the system of equations or use sparse methods for matrix decomposition, and those are used pretty heavily in this uh, research field. Another way is to simplify the power flow equations by, for example, using a linear model, which is easier to solve. A more recent approach is to use machine learning to try to do faster simulation. So for example, you can run a power flow solver for a certain number of time steps, train a model to predict the solution from the inputs, and use that to completely bypass the traditional power flow solver. This speeds up simulation because generally use, evaluating an explicit function is much faster than running a numerical method. And so this has been a really hot topic the last couple of years in this research space, and there's been lots of papers looking at what specific form this data-driven mapping should take and has been shown to speed up uh, simulations considerably. But there's a number of challenges when it comes to actually implementing these methods in the types of simulators that utilities actually use. So one challenge is that previous studies often make a lot of simplifying assumptions about the power flow, which 
makes it pretty much impossible to plug these methods into the simulators that utilities actually use. Another challenge is about generalizability. So a lot of these data-driven models are trained offline on data sets, and then you assume that training data and testing data come from the same distribution, and that you can just apply it to a test set. But often that's not the case, because loading conditions can change, network topology can change, and that assumption doesn't always hold. Another challenge is computation time of some of these data-driven methods. So often some of these, for example, deep learning-based based methods, they're very accurate, you can get very fast predictions, but training them takes a lot of time, and that can outweigh any costs, any benefits from doing fast prediction. And finally, we found that the accuracy of a lot of these methods highly depends on hyperparameter tuning, which means they're not really as robust and applicable for use for people who don't have an ML background. So in our work, we developed a different approach that tries to address some of these challenges, and we implemented it in the GridLab D Power Flow Simulation Engine, which is a popular tool used by a lot of utilities and national lab researchers. So instead of completely trying to replace the Power Flow solver with an ML model, we use ML to kind of augment or accelerate the solver. So instead of training data-driven model offline to predict the power flow solution, we actually update it online during the simulation, and that way it can change to, it can adapt to changing input conditions and helps with generalizability. We also selectively decide when we want to use our approximation and when to fall back on the traditional power flow solver. And so this approach works best when the inputs to the power flow problem don't change that considerably from one time step to another, and we're able to avoid doing redundant co computations and also learn from previous solutions to inform our prediction. So this framework both speeds up, speeds up simulation by avoid using the more computationally expensive power flow solver as much as possible, and also by seeding the power flow solver with a, an approximate data-driven solution so that it converges more quickly. And so we implemented this approach in the GridLab D simulation engine and tested it on a variety of uh, distribution systems. And GridLab D uses what's called newton raphson based method that's based on the current injection method. It's one standard type of power flow solver. And it uses sparse methods for matrix decomposition, so it's already fairly fast. But with our current implementation, we're seeing a speed up of about three to five times the fastest that that numerical method can do. And with a faster implementation, with a better implementation, we think that will be around five to eight times uh, faster. So, but with those computational benefits, there is a trade-off with accuracy. Um, but the errors that we've observed are on the order of 1e minus 5 to 1e minus 3 per unit voltage, which is still very acceptable for a lot of applications. So kind of in conclusion, we found that combining more traditional simulation methods with data-driven prediction is a promising approach for speeding up uh, power flow simulations. And in a future where we have more and more controllable resources in our power systems, and a more distributed grid, it will be more, it will be increasingly important to have tools to do both accurate and fast simulations. So we plan to release this code um, open source as part of the Slack version of GridLabD um, in the future so that it's accessible to both researchers and utilities who utilize these tools. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators uh, David Chasson at Slack, uh, my advisor, Professor Ram Rajagopal, and Adi, Tom, and Siobhan, who are other students who've worked on this project, um, as well as the California Energy Commission for funding this work. And thanks for your attention, and happy to answer any questions uh, later on. Wow. Wow, those are four I incredible talks. I find myself kind of daydreaming in five years while I see this person receiving an award, maybe a Nobel Prize. Uh, 
type work or 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 at Stanford uh, will they, they or their students do a startup that starts as a small company and then becomes the next Google? I think it's actually quite uh, quite possible. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Anybody? Uh, actually, I should say Marlies, our CA, has put the attendance sheets right outside the back and the front door. So please uh, sign them, not the guest speakers, but the students re registered in the class. So any questions? I'm sure we have some uh, aspiring technologists in the audience. Richard, you want to ask one? I could ask one, or Maxine, just to get the ball rolling. Sure. Um, so, um, these are all four excellent talks, and um, I think maybe to Julian I'll ask a question, and that is, um, you left us hanging a bit. You told us the mechanism, but now what's the ways in which you can, you can. Um, what do you see in the future as you work to try and address the issue of this? Yeah, thanks, Richard, for the question. So the, this kind of relates, I think, to the fact that we've now characterized the instability quite well, but maybe don't have the answers in terms of stabilizing the structure in all cases. But uh, the doping, I think, is the best strategy that we can come up with so far and one that we're actively pursuing to stabilize the material. So this is kind of what I discussed before, where we have an electron concentration uh, that's moving around quite a bit in the left panel of this figure. And then if we incorporate a dopant, because it's also positively charged, that's the key thing, the vacancy is a positively charged defect. And so what we want to do is dope with a two plus metal to replace the one plus metal in the structure. Uh, we think that that will, if we, if we get it in at high enough concentration to replace the, the original one plus metal, that it will stabilize that electron concentration, and that's really the key thing towards stabilizing the material in a device stack, for example. So I think the compositional tuning and the dopant engineering is the best way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is for Lily. Um, I'm curious if you, if you also measured the amount of cost improvement there was in addition to the speed improvement. Um, and a follow-up question on that is, where do you see some of the biggest applications? Do you think uh, this will kind of be used in energy trading, or like where do you think these? Um, yeah. Yeah. So by cost, do you mean like money cost, or yeah? So often we talk about cost using a different tool that's called Optimal Power Flow, which is a little bit different than Power Flow. Um, that's it's the tool that we use to dispatch resources and power systems, and so in that type of tool, we think about cost in terms of what resources should we dispatch to minimize cost. So that's also another app tool where ML has been used to accelerate analysis. So in power flow simulation, we don't really think about cost directly. You can derive cost from it, um, but it's not necessarily as relevant. Um, and sorry, what was your second question? Yeah, so where power flow simulation is more, most computationally expensive is for large systems and for distribution systems. So for transmission systems, you can, you can frequently make s simplifications to the power flow equations, which, for example, make them linear and much faster to solve. In distribution systems, you normally have to use a more complicated model, and you have to use these numerical methods to solve them. So it's really distribution systems with a lot of resources, for example, a lot of controllable DERs, energy storage people have in their homes, um, where it's going to be more useful. And we're going to see that increasingly in the future. So, um, I had a question for Julian. Uh, I was wondering if you could put into a bit more context how stability is important here. Is there some industry standard that you're shooting for? Are there some, I don't know, year-long tests that you can do on a perovskite? photovoltaic to determine, like, I don't know, some final metric? Thank you for the question. Yeah. So like I mentioned, we are, we are pretty fundamental inorganic chemists, so we don't make devices ourselves, but we certainly talk with a lot of, of folks who study devices and uh, 
uh, worry a lot more about the stability. But I think a good place to start to discuss this is probably looking at the efficiency scales. So these efficiencies are for vo very small solar cells uh, and typically not stable enough to be actually implemented into a module or something larger than that. And so there are definitely industry standards and, and certain accelerated, uh, accelerated degradation tests that folks can do on devices. Uh, but yeah, so, so far we haven't actually gone into the device world yet personally, but we focus on the crystals and then try and like, basically derive as many insights as we can about the fundamental structure to kind of collaborate with, with people who actually make devices. But in general, I think the key aspect in terms of the stability, um, more broadly speaking, is just the fact that you have a lot of these low energy processes happening in the crystals, so you can move ions through at very low activation barriers. Uh, and like I mentioned, that gives rise to a lot of degradation uh, and some, some basically polarization, meaning you can apply a potential to your device and the internal gradient of ions will actually oppose that field. Uh, so there are a lot of unnecessary or undesirable effects that will, will occur, and we, we kind of collaborate more so than do the device engineering ourselves. Uh, so I have a question for Lily. I was wondering sort of, you mentioned that robustness is sort of a big problem, right, for traditional deep learning methods. How does sort of accelerated learning help with that? Is it that, you know, it's, you're predicting smaller time scales, or are you sort of just using areas where there are stable inputs, so that's not a problem? Sorry, I missed the first part of your question. Um, just about how does the accelerated learning methodology like enhance the robustness compared to traditional deep learning methods? Oh, yeah. So I think the biggest difference between our method and previous methods is training offline versus training online. When you train offline, you basically like need to predict like what your distribution of data you're going to see online. And that can be hard to do. If you have a distribution system with tens of thousands of nodes and switches where the topology can change, you don't know what topology states are gonna see pre-simulation. And so it's just, it's kind of intractable to be able to train a reliable model offline. Um, and so for our approach, we basically, we train a model online and assume that you're simulating at a fast enough resolution so that your state doesn't change a whole lot from one time step to another. And if it does, you just fall back on the traditional solver and accumulate enough solutions until you do have a good model. Um, so by kind of putting the learning in the loop with the traditional solver, instead of just like by itself, adds more robustness. Uh, I had a question for the third presenter. Um, just with the map that you showed with the different sites that you're gonna go to um, for the soil samples throughout the U.S. Were there certain factors that um, influenced your particular decisions for specific sites? And if so, like what were those factors? Yes, that's a great question. Um, they're really glamorous locations. So um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we did have some reasoning behind our choices. Um, so the first was that it's a partnership with Soil Health Institute. So they have a series of site partners that they already have an existing project with that we had a big list of sites to choose from. And then from there, um, we were really interested in five key variables. So climate, texture, tillage, um, mineralogy. So I guess that's four, but climate is moisture and temperature. And so we looked for sites that spanned um, essentially a gradient in each of those variables. So we ended up with a matrix of sites where we could compare three sites from three different temperatures or um, three different precipitation regimes. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, presenting. Those are really uh, interesting and fascinating um, presentations. I had a question about battery cycling time from the in the beginning. So, absence of any change, what should we do to optimize our uh, battery life? If you own an electric vehicle, or you know, even a laptop or a cell phone, what's kind of like best practices for that? Right. Yeah. So, thank. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So I guess there's maybe a couple of things I'll say for this. Um, one is that the particular material we were looking at is sort of like a next generation kind of material. So that is one that like is potentially cheaper and could have higher energy density, but it's not currently in use. Um, 
it's actually not totally clear like how much uh, this oxygen release like slow diffusion is a problem in the materials people use today i think personally i think it is a little bit of a problem but most people think it's not so i don't know we'll see um but yeah, I guess one thing that is kind of interesting is that like any, like the battery in your phone, for example, um, typically the more you charge a battery, the kind of worse it gets. So you can, in terms of stability, you can sort of think of this like, um, you know, like a battery is sort of like, I don't know, when you charge it, you're like pumping water up a hill, it's something like that. So you're always creating something that's like less stable when you charge it. And then when you discharge, you're going back to something more stable. So in general, you kind of want to stay at like low states of charge. But that being said, like your phone, your you know phone manufacturer kind of limits you. It doesn't let you charge high enough to the point where like things start to get really bad. So they're kind of like trying to fix that already. But um, I guess in general, there's always sort of a trade-off between like how far you charge the battery and how much energy you can get out of it, and then how long it lasts. Um, so even using the same material, you can make the battery last longer if you just don't charge it as much, but then you get less energy. Um, so they sort of, the company's already sort of, they have some calculation for whatever, how, how far they'll let you charge it. Um, yeah. My professor one time was kind of joking that like Apple or, so, you know, some, they should give you like an emergency button on your phone that if you're like, you really need it and it's out of, out of power, that just lets you like completely destroy the battery, but use it for another 10 minutes. In theory, like that could work. So I don't know. That's an idea. Anyway, yeah. Great. Unfortunately, I think we're just about out of time. So I'd like to sincerely thank uh, Peter, Emily, Julian and Lily for excellent and very inspiring presentations. Richard for coordination and all of you for great questions. Thanks very much.